So you have file, shared file data on-prem. You want to run services available in the cloud uh, to analyze that file data. And you want to do it data in place without having to, to you know, copy the whole volume of things or whatever. Um, what we're going to demonstrate is how you can put a Hammerspace metadata control plane and have that data get replicated and presented as object in the cloud to those tools and the metadata harvested back from it without, without disturbing the main environment and without forcing you to store everything forever up in the cloud. Um, we have a share called test share that has a number of things in it. Uh, it's a namespace that's uh, um, um, already has some files in it. And from my Mac, I could take and drop more in there, like uh, grab a few more of these images uh, and oh, put them into the hammer space. Um, okay. In a you know in an enterprise environment, you will very likely uh, assimilate an in-place environment. You wouldn't necessarily sit and copy the data. Yeah. In it's just yeah. an example for I the actually, demo. I actually can show that in in the demo, but I wanted to to get through some of this first. Now, uh, when I go, um, let me look under the covers here at that same namespace mounted. These are those same same files. Uh, just drop some in there, and I'll talk about what those sim links are in a little bit. Don't get too confused by them. But uh, if I do an H tag list on everything, then what we're going to see, hello, my networking has been goofing up with sitting here. I hope it's... Uh, well, I'm getting some response now. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay. Just sitting here long enough maybe to page it out. This make me panic. So, <laughs> so image seven has that it's an animal with 82% uh, confidence. Uh, image eight. These are the various images uh, that are in there. Uh, inside of Hammerspace, I've actually used some of these metadata constructs that I want to describe. So we talked about the different types of metadata. But there are tools for working with it where you can apply a filter and basically slice the data set based on what qualifies or not. That's a, think of it as a catalog that's done on the fly. Uh, we talk about them as collections. So a collection is simply a filtered view of the exact same namespace but based on some arbitrary uh, predicate. And um, when I go and look at uh, the... Uh, this filtered view on what's been selected here. Let's see. Let's get that back up. Damn. I let it sit here and it's okay, here we go. Now we're getting them. There, okay. I just had to wait long enough. All right. So, attribute get selected. Remember, things are inherited and whatnot, so it's different to find what it's set to. So I have the selectedness of dot, the entire share, as the expression get the tag animal and if it's greater than 80%. So if I were to get selectedness across uh, everything in the share, it's going to tell me which ones of those evaluate to true or false. And by having set selectedness to that, um, and I already have a collection, dot .collections is a pseudo directory, kind of like dot .snaps, and it has a series of subdirectories that represent the various filters. So by going into one of these, like selected, I'm actually looking at only the parts that fit that filter. It is a complete namespace. It's the complete hierarchy, but projected through the filter. And you can actually mount that. So you could have something where your backup tool or, or other people are only able to see certain subsections of the namespace. But the nice thing about that is you can, you can use that 
uh, as a way to collate the data to, to find what you need. So here's the things that were selected because they had that um, animal tag that animal tag at greater than 80 percent. Um, and the other things did not have it at, uh, at the 80 percent mark. It didn't recognize those so things. So practically you, you query the metadata and you get out a, a subset well, that you need for your, I don't know, indeed. Uh, analytics. Simply, uh, simply, by, simply by incorporating it into the namespace, I have objectives set up that cause that to get published into the cloud for long enough to harvest uh, the actual data. Actually, I have it making a copy and keeping the copy in the cloud. So you can see each of these data items, these images, this is from within our our browser that shows some of the additional information, you can see it's got the, the multiple copies. And the green light is saying that everything is aligned to the objectives. When you first put something in, it might not have copies everywhere that's needed. It's misaligned uh, to it. Now I'll go Directly, through. You don't need to copy it, so you can access from the original repository. That's right. Let me it show is. you how that works here. I'm going to go in. I have a, another volume on this same storage system that has data sitting there um, separate from Hammerspace, and I'm going to go through the process of incorporating that data into the single unified namespace. So now I'm saying I want you to add it into my test share under the directory called images, and um, this is uh, used to know how to do the load balancing, at what threshold do you start to evacuate, that sort of thing, not really relevant for this discussion. We go and add the volume. Now it's going to take a little bit longer than, than normal because it's probing this new volume to see what its performance characteristics are so it can get a, a good sample to start with. This is where the, the machine learning comes in to know how well it can deliver data. But at the same time, it's incorporating that existing in-place data um, without copying it. It doesn't even have to copy all the metadata to get started it copies the metadata on demand. So as somebody comes in through the namespace accessing it, it makes sure to grab those directories as it goes. Of course, there's a background sweeper that gets it all done uh, as, a, as an eventual thing. But this allows you to take and, uh, and incorporate potentially billions of files and be able to start using it instantly through the Hammerspace view, even though in the background it's pulling that metadata across replicating the metadata and keeping tabs on the data itself so that it can orchestrate that up into the cloud. And, so, and if, so just to, to tag on Enrique's point, this is non-disruptive to existing shares. So applications can continue using the, the mount points they already had running. This merely helps enhance the metadata associated with uh, those, those. So things. now it's incorporated this directory called images and it has all of the images that were already sitting on that volume. So you could go around your estate and we have some customers that have literally thousands of file shares, especially because each storage system is a, is a silo to itself, so they have their own shares, right? You can incorporate all those into one, one, uh, one global namespace uh, with all the metadata there and, uh, and then use it. And what you're going to see here is that it has already uh, listened to my objectives and mirrored that to the cloud. So all those images that I pulled in, it's now made copies up in the cloud. And if I've given it enough time, then it will have harvested the metadata. We are actually running uh, AWS's recognition to do image recognition in the cloud and then, and then incorporating that metadata back into this plane. And is for in, in this, this example, is that the ML that you're talking about? Or is there no. Other, no, no. Are you going to go into more detail? Yeah, the ML? that's the that's okay. next section where we talk uh, about our layer of ML. Obviously, okay. this gives you a way to incorporate other machine learning tools to analyze the data and gives the platform for incorporating all the metadata. Maybe but, I missed something. So is this an ongoing thing once you, you set the, the rules or it's just the one uh, uh, single snapshot that you get from my existing data? So if I add more... It's ongoing. Uh, my, it's, more, ongoing. it's ongoing. Oh, it, it, moment, it'll it'll it's async ongoing. replicate okay. from it. You, you can pick I mean, whether you want to do hey, once or... One shot or a continuous... Yeah. Yeah, so I can get a snapshot if I, I need a subset of my data for another right. work? You could assimilate a snapshot, or you could yeah, assimilate yeah, okay. the main tree right. once up front, or you can point it at the main tree and have it continuously adapting to the changes. Right now it's unidirectional, it's not bidirectional. Um, Even a subset of a tree, you don't have to get the whole volume. 
you can just say, I want to take these subdirectories from these four volumes and make a new global namespace. So from a use case perspective, the idea there would be, if I still have legacy applications attacking this share, I'm just going to use that to harvest the metadata out of there and continuously read from it. But the day I want to go bi-directional, I have to say, okay, my legacy now is to go through no, you the hammer twice. space. Yes. Okay. So if I take a step back and try and establish the order in my head, it first seeds the base metadata portion based on what the underlying storage file system exposes. It is. And it absorbs it the file system. Its own metadata mm -hmm. through the use of AI techniques, that, well, platforms like recognition engine from AWS. Whatever you want to bolt up to yeah. add additional extensible metadata that might be you know, programmatically harvested. It might be things that are input by the app owner or business owner that say what, you know, for example, how critical this is to, the, to their, and you can have the, the business logic formulas that turn those things into statements about how you want the data aligned to the infrastructure. What are your intent to the, as to the care and feeding of the data across the environment? So what capabilities comes out of the box from the solution for the customers to just readily use? Uh, to add additional metadata with that so, to you? Uh, we expect to have three. Okay. Image recognition, because it's cool, not necessarily super useful, but you know, <laughs> I do have some of my own engineers using this at home for, for their own <laughs> uh, stuff. The, the second is uh, around compliance, Macy, and, and uh, in Elasticsearch. So uh, the ability to use Macy, the service for grabbing compliance information, uh, those are sort of the three things that'll come out of the boxes as exemplars of it. So then you, then you would just point the legacy when you're done, when you want to use Hammerspace as the now definitive namespace rather than kind of this, I don't know if it's sidecar is the right way to describe it. That is it a perfect, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. Um, then you would just point those legacy apps towards the new namespace then. And it that's would, right. Would, right. So you could use this in a sidecar where we just assimilate out and maybe at some point we replicate back in, but at some point it just becomes better to say, use this as the projection of the namespace for anybody who wants to consume, you know, file and uh, end object. So, um, yeah, let's see what, uh, um, so we've demonstrated assimilation, we've demonstrated the automatic harvesting on the metadata uh, to show what, uh, you know, David, can I ask an architecture question? Yeah, you bet. Well, we're, we're in a multi-cloud environment here, potentially, or, or hybrid cloud. Mm -hmm. w what happens as these environments lose touch with one another? Uh, network partition, let's ah, say. Mm -hmm. So, the, the metadata replication uh, is, because it's not handicapped by having the bulk of data incorporated with it, it's actually using a, a micro snapshot kind of model to where as time progresses and the metadata namespace evolves, uh, it's marking the state of the world and can difference it. So you could be disconnected from another site indefinitely and reconnect and have it merge it. Uh, as a matter of fact, a site that's never been connected to the share, it's really just a merge operation from null. Uh, so the way the replication works is, is always a merge between two uh, snapshot points in time to pull the data together. It's because we're using an optimistic protocol, not uh, that where if you happen to have a collision because somebody messed with the same file in the same directory during the same interval that they were disconnected, then when it merges them, they're going to have to be manually resolved. Um, so because it's an optimistic uh, uh, collision resolution focused thing, you can operate indefinitely. We're not trying to solve the split brain for you. You have to solve it when you bring the brains back together. So you can continue to use them in a split brain scenario, but you should be careful about where you run the app because you're going to have two evolving timelines. And if you pull it back together, uh, it'll keep both, but you're going to have to sort out which one's which. Does that help answer the, the question? Yeah. Um, any, uh, so um, let me point out just some, some other kind of cool things, all right? Um, from the, uh, so um, this is letting me go sort of an interactive console against a specific item in the namespace. Uh, let me get that right. Um, 
do this again. What am I doing wrong? Oh, I know what I'm doing wrong. Let's get to where the file is. <laughs> Um, so this is the full set of all the metadata that's known on this, this, uh, this specific data item. You have your traditional file system <laughs> metadata, your uh, timestamps, whoops, I didn't mean to copy that, whoops. <laughs> ah. do it again. Let's do it again because I copy pasted it. This file. This so so create time, all right? And I can take now and now minus create time. Minus the uh, vote. Three. Oh, yep. Thank you. Now, this the system understands units. It's a typeless language. It's you know, it's like Python and whatnot. You've got strings and you've got numbers, and you can work with them as a variant type. But it actually understands the units that you're talking about. So if I say one uh, byte uh, plus one k byte, it knows what you're talking about. But if I say plus three minutes, it's going to say uh, that doesn't make any sense. And if I say now, like I said, now minus create time, that gives me a number of minutes. Uh, so time spans are actually different than specific date times because they incorporate a reference. So it, it actually follows the units all the way through your formula. So you can't actually do something uh, so blatantly wrong anyway. And it's a macro language that already has things incorporated. So for example, we have the create age that actually is that formula already done for you. So you can work uh, with that. Or you can say uh, last access age greater than five minutes. Uh, uh, How does that help them work with the data, dude? <laughs> so that's the hammer script? Uh... Yes. Uh, sorry, last use, not last access. So um, this is simply the language you can write filters and expressions in the, the, the same kind of business logic that you might use in a spreadsheet to decide under what circumstances should different things be treated differently. Uh, that can be done uh, here within the language for creating your filters. And of course, the, the tags um, uh, are all your tags. All of those different rich types of metadata are accessible from in here when you build, when you build uh, filter expressions or or derivative expressions. So someone it. could write an expression that says, show me all the data that is older than a certain minute then match a certain tag, so content, for example. So if you're understanding what A time and M time is from a file system perspective, you simply write it at a much higher level and we take care of the abstraction down to the underlying storage itself. One thing I should, yeah, a another important thing is that all the interaction you've seen me doing, that's uh, through the namespace itself. Um, just like URIs in the web world where you can ship parameters to the web server through the HTTP blah, 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 question right. mark, we do the same thing through the file system uh, so that we don't have to change the underlying NFS or other protocols. We can ship directives to the back end by encoding them in a pseudo file name. And because of that, you can actually encapsulate those directives in symbolic links, such that the mere act of opening it will do the ship the command and get the answer. So I have some of those here. For example, if I wanted to cat sums, it's going to, uh, sorry, um, sums.hs, it's giving me a collated table of um, all of the different tags. So um, it's saying that, uh, for example, uh, animal, there were three files uh, making up 53 kilobytes, and the top 10 largest files were this, and canine, this, Dalmatian, this, dog. So this is a, um, an aggregation across the namespace that's done 
as part of the query. The nice thing about collections is those have sums that are already uh, done. So if I look at these uh, selected sums, it's really just getting the collection sums from it, but I can cat that. Uh, and it's showing me that for the things that are selected, there's a total of, of uh, three files, and, and here's how big they are. Let me show that that same thing is available from within the, you know, the, the, the file browser, where if I simply say, um, look at this, I, I've got the answer right there. I run that sums command, here's the answer right there. It's actually shipping the query and getting the answer back. So I'm doing analysis against the metadata by merely opening these files that have the an analysis uh, query um, built into them. And those tags, in this case, came from? These tags came from the image recognition the in the cloud and got posted back down. Right. And if we're in a multi-cloud environment, where You can use tools from any of them right, and right, incorporate right. them all together. But then how do we curate the tags? So let's, I'll just pretend that cognitive <laughs> services in Azure calls it dog and cat or feline or something. Like how do, how do so I do So those could be put things? under separate sections. You could route that metadata to be not, in, so right now I have it simply merging the tags that get harvested based on the string of bytes with the, the tags that may have been put in above. So right now it's a simple model. I inherit it down the namespace for the things put in the namespace, and I inherit it up from the byte space for the things that got harvested based yeah. on the string of bytes, and they're just simply merged. Um, those could be held separate, and you can put whatever kind of rules you want to in terms of how to justify the things together. And but this is, but uh, like I'm getting to the heart of just that because I'm a metadata person. <laughs> <laughs> so the tricky part about all this person. magic Absolutely. is reconciling feline, cat, through multi-languages, yep. through regional so, names, like the difference between a turnip and a rutabaga. Yep. You know, those things. So, so the, that's the, the hard part. The beauty is that with this, we have the ability to have taxonomies. Yeah, okay. A label, a label versus a keyword comes from a schema, and the schema is a taxonomy. So by putting a certain label on it, it implies many other things. Yep. So it's actually a more compact form than this because they're repeating the same information over and over again because a dog is a mammal. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It is a this and it is a that. There's no reason to state all of those. If you simply state that it's a dog and, and that that comes from a taxonomy, it gets everything else implied. So, you know, there, there's various tools um, for handling that, but it comes down to having, having at, at your behest those, those different tools and the ability to use them to get cross sections of the data and work with those cross sections. Right, and I could do something like, um, Maybe someplace else in my enterprise, I have a tagging scheme already, uh, either a taxonomy or just mm -hmm. a you know reference data, mm -hmm. and it might be something really proprietary to my business. So That's in the petroleum the point. Wor world, it's wells. Exactly. Right? And so I might have well-specific information, and I can incorporate that and put it in there. Exactly. Okay. And the beauty is then you can use that in the feedback control loop to determine the specific care and feeding instructions for that data across the infrastructure. Okay. Like I said, it's facing both up to be an aid in how to, to, to wrangle the data and to face down being the input to an automation system, which is what we need to jump into next. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, we have and the one quick question then is, okay. when I'm bringing, supposing yeah, the example of the image recognition, because it's easily understandable and parsable, if I send these to two different cloud recognition systems, I can define my metadata with a prefix, say that these yeah. tags came oh, yeah. from Amazon, these tags came from Azure. Absolutely. It's okay. still hard right. to rationalize though. Right. Like but then, for an end user. Right, but that's an yeah. application layer treatment. But that's that's the Not process of going from, well, yeah. from raw uncurated to something that's it's the curation that's a right. curated, right. and then you right. work with it from there. And that being able to cover that dynamic range for different things is really important.